Okay, let's uh, get started. Uh, a couple of PyroSim tips and tricks before we get back to uh, lecture material. Um, two things I want to cover today is getting your robot to see in cover in color and pickling. Okay, so um, let's imagine uh, going back to our trusty friend the quadruped. We're looking from above, and you want to place some objects in the robot's environment that you would like it to see. Let's imagine uh, you place two cubes in the robot's environment. One is red and one is uh, green. How do we get the robot to know whether it's looking at uh, nothing, whether it's looking up in the sky, looking at the floor, looking at the red object, or looking at the green uh, object? You can use the ray sensor. So you already have experience with the ray sensor, which returns, among other things, the distance of the ray at any given point in time. So remember when you collect sensor data back from a sensor, it will typically give you back a vector where the length of that vector is the number of time steps in your simulation. So if you ask for data back from a touch sensor, it will give you back a binary vector of length 1,000 if your evaluation period runs for 1,000 time steps. There are a few sensors in PyroSim that will not just give you back a vector, they will give you back a matrix where, again, all of the elements uh, and all of the columns represent time step, but the rows represent different components of that sensor. So a touch sensor has just one component, whether the touch sensor fired or not. The ray sensor actually has four components associated uh, with it, which is mentioned here. The first, uh, the first one is distance, which is what you've been using uh, in, your, in, in, um, in the assignments. The second, third, and fourth number is the R, G, and B component of the ray itself. So a ray sensor, when it uh, goes out from the robot and hits something, it returns not just the length of that beam, but also the color of the object that was struck. So at this point in time, if the robot's ray sensor happens to hit the red object at that point in time in the simulation, if we were to look at this matrix, which is a four by thousand element uh, matrix, at this point in time, it will return the distance of that ray, and it'll also return the red, the amount of red, the amount of green, and the amount of blue. And at this point in time, it will be one, zero, zero. Okay, so how do you get that information back? If you go to the documentation and you look for get sensor data, when you're retrieving data from a sensor, you give the sensor ID, and there is also this second flag SVI, which is the sensor value index, which is which row of this matrix do you want back? By default, SVI is equal to zero, which always gives you the topmost row. So by default, <clears throat> if you get the data associated with a ray sensor, this call will give you back a one by thousand vector with distance information in it. If you call it a second time on the same ray sensor, you give it the same ID value, but now you give it SVI equals one, it will give you back the second row, which is the amount of red in the ray at every given point in time. Okay, so if you call this uh, four times, you can get the distance information and the RGB components of the ray sensor at every point in time. And then you can use this information to allow your robot to see in color. Um, there's two ways you can do this. When you actually create the ray sensor itself, you can add a sensor neuron and you can attach it to one of these components. So at the moment when you attach a, a sensor neuron to your ray sensor, you attach it with SVI equals to zero, the default. So a ray sensor that's attached to a sensor neuron, by default, that sensor neuron will get the distance information from that ray sensor. You can add a second sensor neuron to the ray sensor. And when you create that second sensor neuron, you send in SVI equals one. And that second sensor neuron will now register the amount of red that the robot is seeing. So by adding sensor neurons to the other components of the sensor, you allow the robot to see in color. 
By retrieving color, uh, color data from the ray sensor, you can incorporate this into a fitness function and use it to select for robot behavior that's dependent on color. Okay, let's imagine, uh, to start with, I'm gonna try and evolve my robot to look at the uh, green block. I'm gonna evaluate the robot a bunch of times. I'm gonna put the red and green block in different positions. And the fitness function is that the robot scans for the green object and fixates it and continues to look at it. How would I construct a fitness function to do so? Reward it for returning green values. Reward it for returning green values, exactly. So we wanted to we wanted you to make sure that the ray sensor is pointing at something that's green for as long as possible. How do we do that in more detail here? So could you sum across the row of all the green values, and you want the max? Could be the max, right? So the, uh, the green component is the third row. So the thing you meant like the max of like, take the sum of red and the sum of each individual thing, and the green one should be the Not the max element that you want. Sum it and take the robot. I mean, you want to maximize the sum. Yeah. Exactly. So we evaluate our robot in the simulator, then we get sensor data, and we pass in the sensor ID for the ray sensor. We pass in SVI equals two, which means gives, give me back all of the green components of the ray sensor, sum that row that's returned, and maximize that in the fitness function. And if you try that out, you should see a robot that eventually is able to scan and fixate on green objects. Okay, any questions about seeing in color or selecting for behavior that's dependent on color in the environment? Oh, a couple other things about that. You've probably noticed by now that the ray sensor will actually turn different colors. So when the ray sensor collides with the ground, it turns black. So despite what the visualization tells you, the ground is perfectly black. When it looks up in the air, um, the ray is a maximum length, and I think actually it returns black in that case as well. So the robot is not really able to distinguish between seeing nothing, looking up into the air, or seeing the ground uh, at a maximum distance away from itself. Anything other than black means it's probably looking, it's looking at something else. It could be a colored object, it could be another robot that's a particular color, which might be useful for those of you that are doing swarm behaviors. Different ways you can use color here. In <laughs> okay, so that's seeing in color. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, pickling, uh, and pickling is a very nice feature of um, Python. Some of you may have used this before. There's a package called pickle. And what pickle will do is to take any arbitrary data structure in Python and pickle it into a particular format and push it out and save it to a file. You can then unpickle something by referencing that file and it will read it back in in the <coughs> Python data structure. So in the old days, those of you that are C programmers, you had to actually do that all by hand. You had to write a lot of code that would convert your data structure into something that could be stored in a file. And then you'd have to write some more code that would read all of that back in and reconstruct the whole uh, data structure for you. Beautiful feature of, of Python is that it does that for you. Okay, so here's a, a little example of pickling in action here in the context of PyroSim. So I import the pickle library. I create a file name. Sorry, let's start here. I import uh, pickle, and I create a file name called robot.p. The .p is just going to remind me that this is a pickled uh, file. I create a robot. I simulate the robot in uh, PyroSim. And when I'm done simulating it, I dump that robot to a file. And then later, if I want, in a separate file, I can again import the pickle library and from robot.p, instead of creating a robot from scratch, I load it back in from the file name. So this is just simple saving and loading, and then I can simulate it uh, a second time. 
Okay, this is extremely useful when you're evolving robots and as your evolution is going, you can pickle, for example, the best robot evolution has discovered so far. And instead of having to stop your program and play it back, you can keep running and as long as you're pickling the best robot, you can write a second piece of code that will read in that robot and play it back in non-blind mode. So you can actually see what it is and every time a new robot appears in the population that has higher fitness than any robot you've seen so far. It gets pickled, you can play it back, and so on. So pickling is good for loading and saving and sort of keeping an eye on your evolutionary run without having to stop the evolutionary run. Okay, the other way that uh, pickling is useful is, as I mentioned, you can pickle any uh, data structure you like. So now, in this example here, I'm pickling not just an individual robot, but I'm going to pickle an entire population of robots. So I create uh, a, a population of random robots. I then do a little bit of evolution here. So for 100 generations, at every generation, I'm going to simulate every robot in the population and delete and create random modified copies and do all the rest. Do that for 100 generations, and after 100 generations, I dump the entire population uh, to a file. So depending on my machine, it might take, for example, eight hours to do these 100 generations. So maybe I start up this code um, in the evening, let it run for eight hours, and in the morning, I see that there is a file called population.p sitting in my directory, which is my evolved and then pickled population. The next evening, I start up this piece of code, which again, instead of creating a random population, reads in my pickled population and simulates it for another eight hours and another hundred generations. So you can dump an evolving population to a file and start it up again uh, later. Okay, that's pickling. Um, here I'm deciding to run my code for 100 generations and then stop, but I may not have a good idea how long that's actually going to take. Depending on the robots in there, that might take eight minutes or eight hours. So another trick is to, instead of iterating for a set number of generations, maybe I continue evolution for a set number of hours. So there is another uh, library in, uh, there's another library in, in Python called um, time. And time is useful because it will just basically consult wall clock time. So it'll look at the clock of your computer and tell you how much time has elapsed. So if when you start up your code, you record start time in a variable. So this is going to encode uh, the current time that the code started. And as your code is running, if you query the time again, and subtract start time. It'll tell you the current time minus the time that the code started, which is measured in seconds. And it'll give you back the total number of seconds that have elapsed since your code started. Right? So if you divide by 60, it'll give you the number of minutes. If you uh, divide by 60 again, it'll give you the number of hours. So you can get back the number of hours that your code has been running, and you could change the for loop here until while number of hours elapsed is less than eight, do another generation, right? It'll keep going, it'll keep going. Actually, let's go back here. So let's say I change this to the while loop, uh, continue evolving this population for eight hours. When eight hours has elapsed, pickle the file, uh, pickle the population and stop. Okay, so you might not be at the point yet where you're ready to do evolution for several nights in a row, but towards the exam period, you'll probably get into this area and this might be useful to you. Any questions about color vision, pickling and unpickling, running for eight hours, we're all good? Okay. Okay, so back to uh, lecture. Where are we and where we're going? We're working our way through this last theme on evolving bodies uh, and brains. We are going to finish our discussion of Carl Sims in a few minutes here and then move on to a different way of evolving bodies and brains. The, what you're going to see in the second attempt is it's a very different genotype to phenotype mapping, a very different algorithm to translate blueprints into simulated robots. But both message, met, methods share one thing in common, which is they don't just produce random collections of objects <laughs> attached together. 
They bias evolutionary search towards parts of the fitness landscape where robots have regular structure in them. They might have repeated segments. They might have bilateral symmetry. The left side of the body looks like the right side of the body. They might have radial symmetry. So looking around the center of the robot, it looks similar uh, around its edge, other kinds of similarities. So uh, in the second approach, we're actually, they're actually gonna look at, is that actually useful? So we're gonna look at a control case where they used exactly the same method, but they knocked out one part of their method so that it doesn't bias evolution towards regular structures and we'll see how useful this actually is. Okay, so back to uh, Carl Sims. Just to remind you, this was some work that was done uh, over 20 years ago and is still somewhat the state of the art in the field. Yes? Just something about, um, you said before. Yep. Uh, for, for running something for eight hours or a number of generations, yes. it seems like a lot of the projects that we've been learning about have run them for 100 or 200 generations tops. Yes. Um, is it useful to run them past that? I don't know. It depends on what you're doing, right? So some, some of the behaviors, if you create a good fitness function, then you create a fitness landscape that has very smooth surfaces in it, and it's going to be relatively easy for evolution to start from any place in that fitness landscape and climb to the one single, the top of the one single mountain. In that case, you probably don't need too many generations. If the ch task is challenging, you have lots of local optima, right? Which means there's lots of places for the population to get stuck. So you might want to create a large population. So you're starting search from lots of different places in the fitness landscape. And you might want to run for a large number of generations to allow those individuals to hop off of local peaks and land on the slopes of higher peaks. It totally depends on what you're, what you're doing. Okay. Yes, Jonas. Do you think there's anything you said when mutating multiple genes, if you have a like you have a hidden layer and a large genome. Like yes. Okay. So that's a really good question. Is is how much should you mutate a given genotype? Um, that's something we haven't talked about here. It is a bit of a black art, and as you can imagine, there's a sweet spot. So if you're only if you're only mutating one synaptic weight, for example. You're only moving a small horizontal distance in the fitness landscape, but that may be insufficient to escape from the local optima that you're trapped on. On, on the other hand, you may choose to mutate many uh, elements at the same time, which means you're making a larger jump in a horizontal direction, but that also means that you're hitting your genotype with a sledgehammer rather than uh, tweezers, right? So it's very difficult to say, and the, the short answer is hedge your bets. So again, if you're going to run things for longer, you can, uh, you can expand your mutation operator to say, first of all, um, pick a random integer between one and five, and that integer is going to indicate how many different elements of your genome you're going to mutate. If the, if the integer is three, you're going to pick three different synaptic weights or three different parts of your genotype and mutate, mutate them. If five is too many, then those individuals will die off. If one is too few, those will also die off. And if two or three is right, then evolution will eventually make use of it. Okay. There are more sophisticated things we can do, but they're sort of beyond the scope of this, this course. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so back to Sims. Uh, just to remind you, we're looking at these uh, creatures that are made up of collections of rectangular solids. We looked at the evolution of individual behavior, and then we ended last time by looking at uh, the last experiment that Sims did in this paper, which is to compete pairs of robots against one another. And the better that I do my, fun my fitness is how close I get to the object and how far I keep you from getting to the object. But then it becomes a little bit difficult to think about how to actually evaluate the individuals in the population, because we're not evaluating one individual after the other, we're evaluating pairs. So we could compete every pair of robots against one another, but that's computationally expensive. As we saw last time, that's n squared. We could simply pair up robots in the population uh, at random, which is fast, right? We have n divided by two simulations we need to run, but we have a pretty poor estimate of the fitness of each individual in the population. All that we know is that it beat the other guy or lost to the other guy. We could organize things in uh, a tournament here. 
um, which is not log, it's n minus one, but still, it's still computationally uh, inexpensive. But as we know from March Madness, brackets have a problem as well. If I'm the second best robot in the population and I happen to be teamed up with the best robot in the population, I'm gonna get knocked out in the first round. So my fitness is going to look like it's as bad as it can possibly be, but you've missed the fact that I'm act I could actually outcompete all the other individuals, but I never had the chance to do so. So Sims came up with what he called the all versus best uh, strategy, which was kind of interesting. So in the first population, he competes every individual against every other individual. So the first generation is computationally expensive, but we now have an accurate estimate of the fitness of everyone in the population. He knows which robot was the best in the population, uh, this one here, the boldened circle. At the next generation, when robots are killed off and randomly modified copies of their survivors are created, he's only going to do n minus one competitions where every individual is going to compete against the best individual from the previous generation. So it's computationally cheap and also gives a good estimate of every individual in the population. Why? Do you have an idea? They're all going against the same competitor. They're all going against the same competitor, right? So we're leveling the playing board. So I know that if robot I here does better, that, uh, gets a higher fitness than robot J, I'm pretty sure that I would outcompete J. Not 100% sure, but pretty sure, right? So it's a pretty good, pretty good estimate. Okay, so he used this idea of all versus best. Um, and then here are the, the computational expenses for these four. He then tried something else which was kind of interesting, which is to create not just one population, but two populations, and did sort of the same thing. So he tried all versus all, which is again computationally expensive. You can pair up one individual from population one with a random individual from population two. Again, computationally cheap, but doesn't give a good estimate. Then did the all versus best between these two species. So every individual in population one competed against the best from population two and vice versa. And what happens then in experiment G down here is that you get basically these two species that are competing against one another. It doesn't matter in this case how well this robot does versus this robot, it's only how well this robot or the fitness of this robot is relative to the fitness of this one. Question? Yep. Um, that that exactly, it's excessive. So it gives a perfect estimate of the fitness of these. We know how well each robot, we literally know how well each robot here does against every robot in the other population. But it's excessive in the sense down here, where by competing every robot here against just the best one, we also have a pretty good estimate of the ability of these, these robots. Just to sort of, yeah, compare them. And uh, he didn't report the results in here, but generally speaking, uh, E was as good as G, would produce just as good robots, but took much longer to do so. How were these populations created? They're initially created at random, as always, right? And then... Species is kind of arbitrary to start randomly. Well, these, exactly. So at the beginning, we have these two species, and they start random, right? And now your fitness in your population is computed based on how well you do against other individuals in the other population. So what we're visualizing in this slide here is the way in which the fitness of the robots in the population were calculated. And then deletion and creating random, random modified copies is done as, as usual. This is just computing fitness. OK, so let's look at uh, experiment G. Here are some results showing the fitness of the best individual in, population, in species gray and the best individual in species black. What happened in uh, run A at the top here? Or sorry, not best, but average fitness of the individuals in species one and species two. Ah. 
So walking from the left to the right side of this panel, as always, is showing evolutionary time, and the vertical axis is showing fitness. Coexisting, Sorry? Coexisting. They're coexisting. So at certain points in evolutionary time, one species is doing slightly better at approaching the block and keeping the other one away, and vice versa. Uh, is, is it working like a GAN? In a very general sense, yes, in that they are antagonistic. They're working against one another. Could you do it? Could you do it? Could you use a, a GAN here? Possibly. Um, you could use a GAN, for those of you that know what they are, to actually generate robots. You could use a GAN as a, as a mutation operator, right? Hasn't been done yet. Um, Sam, who is here as a guest lecturer, that's exactly what he's trying to do. Okay, so yes, these two species are antagonistic against one another. Generally speaking, if there's an improvement in fitness in one population, by definition of the fitness function, fitnesses in the other population are going to go down, but generally speaking, there's, there's coexistence here. Let's go back to the fitness function for a moment. Remember that, um, remember that uh, robot one is trying to minimize its distance to the object and maximize the distance of the other robot from uh, the cube, so higher F is better. So for most of the time here, for or a short period here, the black ones were doing a little bit better and the gray ones generally took over, not too bad. We went back and ran the code exactly as it was again, and now the black population is dominating, which again makes sense because these two species are kind of arbitrary. What happened in run C here? It didn't die out, so there's no way to actually delete them all. They might as well. What's that? Can you tell us what competitive exclusion is for so, those who don't know? Um, the black species outcompeted the gray species and drove its population or its fitness a lot lower in that particular environment. Exactly, right? So you can see that, uh, that somehow the black uh, population hit upon a strategy that was so good that the fitness of all the individuals in the gray population more or less went to zero. There were a few blips here, but generally speaking, all of the gray robots have a population of zero. So uh, I'm not sure which uh, video this corresponds to. If you go back and watch the videos, it's probably one of the ones where the robot reaches out and pushes the other robot away from the, the cube, right? What does the fitness landscape look like for the gray robots? This is one of the tricky things to think about here. We have two separate species. They're on their own fitness landscape. For everything we've seen so far in this course, the fitness landscape, once we define the fitness function, the shape of that landscape is different. The moment we pit these two species against one another, something happens, which is these two fitness landscapes for these two species become fitness oceans. So the actual peaks and valleys of those fitness landscapes are moving over evolutionary time. Whenever there's a change in the behavior of one population, what might have worked for one gray robot that's sitting on a peak in the gray fitness landscape, that strategy no longer works against the new most fit black robot. So that peak drops, right? And that gray robot, which does exactly what it did before, now gets low fitness relative to the new black competitor, right? So these two fitness landscapes, the shape of them are actually moving as these two populations evolve. So what does the fitness landscape look like for uh, the gray robots at this point in time? Is it kind of the inverse of the black robots fitness landscape at the time? Pretty, uh, not quite, because that, that would indicate that two points at the same place in both landscapes, one is high and one is low, and the same place in those two fitness landscapes mean those two robots do exactly the same thing, which is not necessarily the case here. What's happening? Oh, it may still have peaks and valleys and whatnot, but it seems like every time it gets to take, uh, take a step up a peak, the black population pushes it back down. Exactly, right? So there are, there is somewhere in the gray fitness landscape a solution that will beat out 
the, uh, the robots in the black population, right? But wherever those peaks are, they're a long way from where the gray robots are at the current point in time. So they're sitting in some valley, which is as low as you can possibly go, and that valley is perfectly flat, right? Any mutation to the gray robots might change their behavior a little bit, but it has no impact on the black, uh, the robots in the black population, right? There are a few exceptions here, but they're probably just very small peaks in this low, flat region of the fitness landscape. That's the idea of competitive exclusion, right? You have two species competing against one another. One species has hit on a solution that's so good, the other species can have, has no way to counteract it. And in reality, that species would probably be driven to extinction unless something else happens. Okay. Okay, so that completes our discussion of the first attempt in the literature to try and evolve robot bodies and brains. We're going to now jump to uh, a more recent attempt. This was published back in 2001. And this attempt to evolve robot bodies and brains actually draws on an even earlier idea from computer science, going back to the 1980s now, which is turtle graphics. Everybody remember turtle graphics? I think it's still used to teach computer science to, to little kitties. Here's the idea. You have a turtle. You can pick up that turtle, and you can drop it at some place on a piece of paper. And then you tell the turtle what to do. For example, you tell the robot to move forward 10 paces, turn to the left 95 degrees, assume that the turtle is holding a pen. The turtle can drop the pen or lift the pen. So step three, we tell the robot to drop the pen, move forward, and it draws a line on the piece of paper. We then tell it to lift the pen. So this is sort of a gentle way to introduce non-coders to the concepts of coding and algorithms. right? And turtle graphics, the, the innovation here is obviously when you run this algorithm, when the turtle executes the commands, it leaves behind a, a visual trace. So you can actually, for again, for non-coders, as they start to build up an intuition for what an algorithm actually is, it helps to be able to see literally what is the effect of that, that algorithm. Okay, it's an old idea in com uh, computer graphics and computer science and is still used to, to teach uh, programming to, to young people. Okay, uh, so this little cartoon here, this was not drawn by the code that you see to the right. What was the code that was given to the turtle to get it to draw this picture? Turtle starts in the center of this piece of paper. What's the algorithm? You're all master coders by now. You should be able to reverse engineer this problem. Given this image, what was the algorithm that produced it? So there's about a thousand line segments here. The code that produced this is probably not a thousand lines long. You could write it with a thousand lines of code, but you're all master programmers. You know you don't necessarily have to do that. So there's a for loop in here somewhere. So it's, I think the tricky part is, well, okay, so it's turning 90 degrees. Uh, is it turning 90 degrees? Close. Yes, no. <laughs> Close. <laughs> Not quite. It's not exact because it's like All right. red. Or it could be like for for um, i equals one to one thousand. Like okay. Move forward i paces then turn left ninety five degrees. Okay, so ninety five degrees, possibly. So you said move forward. So we're gonna put. You're gonna have, we're gonna have move forward and turn some degrees to the left, right? question is how many degrees and how far forward at each iteration through the loop. If we moved forward the same distance and we turn 90 degrees, what picture would that algorithm produce? A square. It's not a square, so it's definitely not 90 degrees, and it's not a constant distance each time through the loop. We go, we go straight, let's say, one pace, turn 90 degrees, go forward one pace. Uh, if we turn 95, it'll produce, yeah, a circle, you're right, one of these spirogram pictures. So it's not quite that. 
Not so easy, actually, in the, in the details. Is it incrementing the top arms forward every time it goes through? Exactly, right? So if you look carefully, the line segments are getting longer each time through. So the length that we move forward is going to have to increase. And the angle, is the angle constant? Is it changing? If you didn't do it recursively, and if you just increase like some highest value. P possibly, right? As, as master coders, we know there's multiple ways you could code this up. We're going for the easier way, which is the for loop. Okay. So if you look carefully, it's actually less than 90 degrees. And we're going to use the, the variable for the for loop to increase the, the distance. Okay. If you're comfortable with matplotlib at this point, it's a lot of fun to sit down and write some code like this and connect it with matplotlib and see what kind of pretty pictures you can produce with turtle graphics. Okay. What does turtle graphics have to do with evolutionary robotics? We will see in a moment. But we're going to pause for a moment, put this tool in our pocket, and visit another concept from the history of computer science, and this is formal grammars. Okay, so just to remind you, you've probably seen these before, what's a formal grammar? Well, this is actually a formal way to approach the construction of language. We're going to assume that we have an alphabet, uppercase V. You can imagine the alphabet as a set, and that set can contain uh, uh, variables or words or letters, if you like. Um, and our formal grammar is going to be defined in a, in a number of ways. First of all, we're going to define the alphabet. What are the actual variables that are allowed? We're going to create a starting sentence, which is a list of these uh, variables. So let's say our variables are A and B, and we're going to start with a starting sentence of AB. We're going to then define a set of production rules. We can have one or more production rules. Each production rule is made up of two parts the predecessor and the successor. And what does that mean? It means that as we scan our sentence, if in that sentence we come across a variable that appears on the predecessor, uh, in, the, in the predecessor, erase that variable and replace it with the successor. Okay. So uh, in this little cartoon example here, we have sentence A, B. We're going to scan the starting sentence. We see A, and we replace A with A, B. So now our sentence becomes A, B, B. We keep going. We move on to B. We take B. We find that it, there is a production rule for this. Replace B with A, so we get A, B, A. Right? So we have a new sentence. If we go back and apply the production rules to the sentence again, we'll get another sentence and another one and another one and another one. So why is this called a formal grammar? Because it shares in common with informal languages like English and Mandarin the fact that you're manipulating sentences that are made up of words or variables or, or characters. Okay. Um, we mentioned variables. You can also have constants. So a constant is something that exists in our alphabet. And that, that constant never appears as a predecessor. So if we ever see C, the letter C in our sentence, there is no production rule that matches it. So we can't replace C with anything else. It's a constant. No matter how many times we apply the production rules, it's going to stay constant. OK, so we've now defined our formal grammar. We can apply these production rules to a sentence and transform these sentences until eventually they're all constants. Alternatively, if we keep applying the production rules and we don't see any constants, we can keep applying this rule forever. Okay. There's a lot of different flavors of formal grammars. This is sort of the most basic one you can imagine. One of the interesting things about formal grammars that was discovered in the 80s is that they can actually be used to model biological phenomena. Biological species are not running production rules, but it was kind of surprising to see that you can actually create relatively simple formal grammars that when you run them, they reproduce behavior seen in nature. This is from the Wikipedia page for um, Lindenmeyer systems or L systems. We mentioned this last time. What is an L system? An L system is a particular formal grammar that's created as a model of some biological phenomenon. Okay, so here's a Lindenmeyer system that uh, is very, very simple. We have variables A, B, no constants. Our start sentence is made up of just A, and we have just these two production rules. 
Okay, YA and YB, so these are going to represent uh, algae, and A is going to represent an adult algae, and B is going to be a bud that buds off the side of an adult. Okay, so that, that's what these variables represent. What do the production rules represent? Oh, uh, what, do these, what do these production rules represent about algae? Exactly. So A becomes AB. An adult A produces a bud to the side of it, AB, and a bud will mature into an adult, right? That's it. There's a biological model for you. I challenge you to find a simpler biological model. If we take one adult algae, our starting sentence, and we apply the production rules, yes? It, it doesn't reproduce. So notice here that the bud, this one character, becomes a different character, right? It's not reproducing, it's that one character, which is one cell of the algae, change, just changes. So it's string A, B, A, and started with A, now it's and then it the bud. Exactly. So you can see here we've got one character, and, and afterwards we have two characters. That's reproduction. Here we have one character, and we end with one character, which just represents the fact that that one individual changed. Yeah? Okay. So we start with one adult. That adult produces a bud. That adult at the next time step produces a second bud at the same time that the first bud matured into an adult. Now we've got two adults in the population and one bud, and if we keep re running this, you see something that usually happens with algae, which is given enough nutrients, which is not in the model here, they increase at an exponential rate. Yes, that's right. So, All right, let's check. ABA, so A becomes AB. Now we visit the second term here. This bud becomes this A. And remember, we have to visit the third one. So we're, we're scanning this sentence to produce the new sentence. So we visit this, which becomes AB. We visit this, which becomes A. And we visit this, which becomes AB. Gotcha. OK. OK, so again, a very, very simple example. But this was very surprising at the time. Right? It was thought that in order to model biological organisms and their behavior, like exponential growth here, we would need a much more complex mathematical model. Turns out, at least in some cases, that's not the case. One of the things that L systems tend to do are produce self-similar patterns. So if you go back and look at the algae here, and if you stare at n equals 7 long enough, there's some regularity in that pattern. So you tend to get uh, what what uh, formal grammars tend to produce, and Lindenmeyer tends, systems tend to produce, are fractal systems or self-similar systems. So here's a common fractal called Cantor dust. And again, for the mathematicians among you, pick your favorite fractal and try and write down a formal grammar that will produce it. Pretty easy for Cantor dust, not so easy for other kinds of fractals. It's possible, but challenging. <laughs> so let's now take our turtle graphics and connect it with the formal grammar. So we're putting these two ideas from computer science together. And now, our sentence is going to be a string of instructions that we send to the turtle. Yeah? OK. So uh, what do we have here? We have A is going to represent draw forward. So the turtle moves forward with the pen down. And B means the turtle is going to move forward with the pen up. Right? If we start with our starting sentence of just A, that means, and we send that to the turtle, it's going to draw one line, right? Which is the zeroth iteration of Cantor dust. If we apply it uh, again using these production rules, A becomes ABA, which is draw forward, move forward, draw forward, which produces the first iteration of Cantor dust. And if we apply the production rules again, we get the second row and the third row and the fourth row and, and so on. It kind of makes sense that a formal grammar will produce a self-similar or fractal pattern, 
because we're replacing one pattern, we're embedding within one pattern uh, a version of the entire pattern, and so on, right? On and on and on. Okay, so when we put these two things together, we put turtle graphics together with the Lindenmeyer system, the turtle will tend to draw not just pretty pictures, but fractals. Okay. The next revelation uh, in the 80s about L systems is when you move to two dimensions using fractal graphics, you start to get uh, formal grammars that produce things that look very much like plants. And there are L systems out there for now for particular species of plants. Again, the plants are probably not running a Lindenmeyer system, but there is something, some sort of regularity in plants that's being captured by these uh, L systems. Okay, so let's have a look at this particular uh, L system. It's a little more complicated now. Um, we have X, and X is just going to is just sort of a placeholder. It doesn't actually send any commands to the turtle. So if the turtle sees X, it just ignores it and goes on to the next uh, the next character in the sentence. Um, plus and minus, uh, turn left 25 degrees, turn right 25 degrees, uh, F is forward, that's pretty straightforward. We're going to introduce two additional variables to our alphabet, which is push and pop. So we're now going to add a third concept from computer science, a stack. And what that means is that as the turtle is executing each variable in the sentence, it's, that turtle is going to exist at a particular position in two-dimensional space. It's going to have a particular orientation, and it may also have the pen down and up. So imagine that the turtle has state, position, orientation, and pen up or pen down. When the turtle hits a push uh, character, it will push its state onto the stack, and then it will move on and keep executing variables in the sentence. When it gets to a pop, it will teleport to previous state. So it will pop the most recent state that it pushed to the stack, and it will teleport back to the position and angle stored in that, uh, in that popped state. Make sense? OK. I'm not going to walk you through this, but you can sort of get the idea about what happens. The turtle starts at the stem here, draws a line, goes out and draws a left branch, and sort of completes the left branch, and then hits one of these pop uh, commands and teleports back to the V where the branch branched off from the main stem. And now it hits a new command in the string and will go off and make the right hand branch. Are these uh, turtle graphics with plants used at all on animation? Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So in a lot of uh, sophisticated computer graphics now, when they're representing plants and even animals, somewhere down deep there's an elaboration of an L system. That's right. Okay. Okay, so again, what does this have to do with evolutionary robotics? Well, in 2001, uh, Hornby uh, and Pollock took this idea of a pl con combining a formal grammar and turtle graphics. So now we we're going to have a turtle that exists in three-dimensional space. And instead of dropping ink as the turtle moves, it's going to drop parts of a robot. So the turtle is going to construct the body of a robot as it goes. Okay, here's how this works. On the right hand side here we have our list of all of the variables that can uh, show up in the sentence. Like before we have push and pop. Remember now that our turtle is going to exist in three-dimensional space. So whenever we hit a push state we're going to push the three-dimensional position of the turtle and its orientation in three-dimensional space. We also are going to introduce um, open curly brace and closed curly brace. And this is basically an iteration set. So as the turtle is moving along the sentence, if it hits an opening bra uh, curly brace, it knows that the next set of elements, until it hits the closing curly bracket, it's going to have to execute, go back and execute that set of commands multiple times. And associated with the closing curly bracket is an integer which tells the turtle how many times to repeat. So it's going to scan the characters in the string n times and construct whatever is in there n times. Okay. Forward, the, the turtle is going to move forward. So remember it has an orientation in three-dimensional space. So it's going to move forward according to its orientation and drop, in our case, a cylinder right along that length. 
It can move backwards along pieces that it's already uh, constructed. And then we have Revolute 1 and Revolute 2. Um, Revolute is just another word for a hinge joint. So the turtle is going to move forward and it's going to add a joint that rotates about the Z axis, which points up. So as it's moving forward, whatever the two, it's, it's sitting on a bar, whatever the closest bar is, it's gonna connect those two bars together with a Revolute joint that rotates those two objects through the X, Y plane which is normal to the z, uh, the z axis. Okay. Alternatively, it may drop Revolute 2, which is a joint that's going to rotate about the y axis, and y is this one here. So it's going to, for example, if this is y, they're going to rotate, the two objects are going to rotate about the y axis. These two characters, Revolute 1 and Revolute 2, also have an integer associated with them, which is the number of degrees of freedom, um, or sorry, it's the, rate, it's the rate of oscillation of the motor. So we're going to have a CPG in there, we're also setting the frequency of that, the CPG that's attached to the joint. Okay, the rest are pretty straightforward. We have six additional characters, up, down, left, right, counter, and clockwise. And the integer here is the number of degrees that you turn to the left or the right or up or down or clockwise or counterclockwise, right? Okay, so if you imagine a sentence now of arbitrary length that's made up of some random collection of these commands, you would see in the simulator a turtle moving in three-dimensional space, dropping cylinders, dropping revolute joints, and connecting up uh, a robot. So here's our turtle here. Um, it moved forward and dropped uh, one piece, moved forward again and dropped another piece, executed the move backward command, so now it's sitting here. It executes the turn left by 90 degrees and moves forward, drops a bar, moves forward again and drops a bar. And the little rotation here shows us that these two pieces have been attached by Revolute 1 or Revolute 2. Okay, so far so good? Okay, so this is the turtle constructing the body. What about the brain of the robot? This takes a little bit of, to wrap your mind around. The turtle has a position in three-dimensional space in the simulator, but at the same time, the turtle is also sitting inside the robot and is constructing the brain of the robot at the same time. An easier way to think about this is that there are two turtles both turtles are going to be reading a sentence, and some of the characters in that sentence are body variables, and the body turtle says, I got those, I'll take care of those. The brain turtle, when it sees a brain-related character, says, I will take care of those. Okay, so on the right here, these are all the brain-specific uh, elements uh, of the sentence that are possible. Again, we have push and pop, but these are specific to the brain uh, turtle. So they're gonna push and pop the state of just the brain turtle. The turtle is going to exist uh, on a, any given synapse. So as the neural network grows, you'll notice in each of these neural networks, there's an emboldened synapse. That's the synapse where the turtle is sitting. Never sits on a neuron, only ever sits on a synapse. Okay. So here we go. So push will push the home link or the, the link or the synapse that the turtle is currently sitting on. As the turtle is constructing the brain, if it hits a pop command, it will teleport back to the synapse dictated by that popped synapse index. Okay. Um, the turtle, if it's sitting on a given uh, synapse, might decrease the weight of that synapse, which is decrease weight. There should be an increase weight here somewhere. I don't see it. I probably just neglected to add it. So the brain, uh, the brain turtle can increase or decrease the weight of the synapse that it's sitting on. It can also duplicate a weight, so or duplicate a synapse. So let's assume in, in the description of all of these that the turtle is sitting on a synapse and there is uh, A behind it and B in front of it. Remember, A is the presynaptic neuron. It's the neuron that sits at the base of the synapse. And B is the postsynaptic neuron, the neuron that sits at the head of the synapse. Right? So duplicate is just create two copies. The turtle continues to sit on the original one, but duplicates off another one. So now there are two synapses going from A, neuron A to neuron B. 
loop, which is create a new link from B to itself with weight N. B is the postsynaptic neuron, so it adds a self weight at, it adds a self synapse at the postsynaptic uh, neuron. Merge, it's going to take synapse, uh, neuron A and neuron B and connect, collapse them into a single neuron C. And if there were any synapses going in or out of A and B, they all now go into and out of the single resulting neuron C. And because of this merge event, um, the turtle has to move, so it hops to the nth input link to C. Okay. Parent means the turtle is going to move upstream. It's moving towards the stems of uh, the arrow. So it's sitting on a synapse that connects A to B. So it's now going to move backwards and it's going to sit on the nth input synapse to A. It's moving upstream by one neuron. Still sitting on a synapse, but sitting on a synapse upstream. So now it's sitting on a new synapse where the postsynaptic neuron is A, and there's a new neuron upstream of it. Okay, same thing with next. Now it's going to move downstream. This, the turtle looks at the postsynaptic neuron B and looks at the synapses that are leaving B and picks the nth uh, synapse and moves there. Reverse is that it just takes the synapse it's sitting on and reverses the direction of that synapse. Um, output, uh, it's going to take the presynaptic neuron and it's going to connect it to the closest joint. What do we mean by the closest joint? What is the closest joint? We're back to the body now. What do you think the closest joint would, would be in this context? Closest to whom? The, neur the neurons don't really, they don't really have a position here, right? So we talked about drawing in the body, the body turtle is drawing in three-dimensional space. There's no real sense of distance or space in the brain here. So what does closest mean here? Like you kind of mentioned two turtles, but yep. like it has a place to, the physical one has like a location, so wherever that is. Exactly. So it's the, the joint that is closest to the body turtle, right? So the body turtle says, I'm over here, send an outgoing synapse from neuron A to this joint and connect it to this joint. So we're connecting brain to body. Okay. Last one, uh, split here, which obviously the inverse of merge. So we've got A and B, and they're connected by the synapse that the brain turtle is uh, sitting on. So we're going to create a new neuron C that is going to sit midway between A and B. Right? So we create C, uh, and we attach the edge that the turtle is sitting on now. Instead of going from A to B, it goes from A to C, and we create a new synapse that goes from C to B with weight N. So all of these commands here have some parameter associated with them except for reverse. Okay, so let's try and build up a bit of an intuition for what these commands are actually doing. So let's take this starting neural network. This is in essence our starting, uh, our starting state here. We have our turtle that is sitting on this synapse and the brain turtle starts to march along a sentence which is some collection of these commands. What is the command that the turtle hit so that it turns this neural network into this neural network? It's a little confusing because the labels of these neurons are A and B and C. Not quite. Doing a split. Doing a split, right? So split is the only command here that adds a neuron. That's the hint, right? So if you read off uh, split here, it talks about A and B, which is confusing because in uh, the starting neural network here, A is A and B is A also, right? So it's putting a new neuron, this one, between A and A, so it, it still connects up A to C, which is this one, with the, uh, with, the original, uh, with the original synapse and adds a new synapse 
that connects C to B with a new, a new weight. And as you can see in this picture, and it's missing from the description here, the turtle hops onto the new synapse that it just created. How do we get from neural network B to neural network C? This one's a little easier. That's duplicate, right? So we've just added. Okay, we'll leave the rest as an exercise for the reader, but you can see that as the turtle executes these commands, it's elaborating an initial simple neural network into a more complex neural network. As we change the sentence here, as we, if you created a different sentence and put the turtle back on the same starting neural network, it would build a different neural network. So far, so good? Okay, so we've combined turtle graphics with a formal grammar and take, taken that combined algorithm and attached it to PyroSim. And we're gonna have these two turtles constructing the body and brain together. Okay. Right, and a turtle points to both a body part and a synapse. It's easier to think about two turtles. Um, and we just talked about this. The output command will connect part of the neural network to the body, to a joint. Okay. Okay, one final detail here. When we introduced uh, formal grammar a few slides back, I mentioned that there are many different flavors of formal grammars. In this particular paper, they used a parametric L system, okay? Which means that if you look now at these two production rules here, there is a parameter associated with uh, the predecessor and also a condition on the parameter. What that means is the parameter is going to indicate which, in this case, of two successors are going to be applied depending on the value of the parameter. Without the parameter, we always have one predecessor and one successor. In a parametric L system or parametric formal grammar, we can have one predecessor and one or more successors. And which of those successors is applied depends on the parameter. Okay. So here's an example um, from the paper. They start with A and they set the parameter, initial parameter equal to four. So we see that there is indeed a production rule where A appears in the predecessor. So we know we're gonna, be, we're gonna apply this production rule to this uh, variable. We check the parameter, it's greater than one. So we apply this successor here. And as we do, we decrement the uh, we decrement the parameter. And if we keep going, eventually we see that we'll end up with essentially constants. Because now you'll notice that for each of the two successors, if n is less than one, it gets replaced with this. So if n is zero, it gets replaced with itself. There's no more change in the system. So why are they using a parametric Lindenmeyer system? It's because, as you can see from this example, it adds in recursion. It allows you to add, uh, to add these successors in a certain way until some base condition is hit. Why do you think they want to add in recursion? What might be the use of it here for building bodies and brains? Uh, well, for the, I guess, you want the same thing same kind of thing happen over and over again to create the segment. Okay. And you want it to stop. Yeah. Exactly, right? So you want it to do something over and over again and then stop at a certain condition, which we saw in Sims already, right? With the recursive limit and the terminal only flag. So recursion is useful because it allows to add multiple things, like multiple fingers that are all more or less the same, and then add an additional thing that's different from the other ones. That's a common pattern you see in, in nature. Okay, so, so far now, we've talked about uh, adding uh, the system to our simulator to construct body and brain. We haven't said anything about the evolutionary algorithm yet. So let's finish by talking about the evolutionary algorithm. For any evolutionary algorithm, we need a genotype and a phenotype, right? The blueprint and the thing that the blueprint creates. The phenotype is obvious. It's, as always, the simulated robot, the body and brain. What is the genotype in this system? Or the sentence that you generate in the string? Or the string? 
It's exactly. It's this. It's the the string itself that's produced. This is the thing, the blueprint that the turtle is going to use to construct the phenotype. What is the thing that translates the genotype into the phenotype? We called this the genotype to phenotype map last time. What's the thing that turns the genotype into the phenotype here? The rules of existence. Exactly, the production rules. Okay, so now we're going to do something a little bit confusing. In everything you've seen in this class so far, the evolutionary algorithm, it usually mutates the genotype, right? It makes some change to the genotype. The evolutionary algorithm here is not going to play with this or the starting string. Instead, it's going to play with the production rules. It's going to tinker with the thing that turns the genotype into the phenotype. A little bit different from what we've seen so far. Okay, so again, we've seen lots of different genotypes and lots of different data structures. So now we're going to focus on this data structure. This is the thing that evolution is going to modify. That system, that data structure can contain one or more production rules. As, we can, as we've seen here, each production rule can be, has a predecessor, can be anything from the alphabet. Each one of those things can have a parameter associated with it. It can also have conditionals, and it can have each individual production rule can have one or more successor. So what do you think the mutation operators do with these production rules? What are the kinds of modifications that evolution could make here? Let's say this is actually an individual in the population, what might mutation change here? Well, are we allowed to like add new rules? There's one mutation operator, add a new production rule, absolutely. Could change the constants in the greater or less than equations so that certain things become or translated more often? Yep, exactly. So we could say, uh, let's say we have three production rules, so pick a random integer between one and three, which picks a particular production rule, that production rule happens to have two, uh, that production rule has this conditional here, so go into the conditional, pick, flip uh, a new coin or pick a new random integer and that becomes the new parameter, which is gonna change how many times that uh, production rule is applied. You could pick a production rule, yep. I was just wondering, like, if we're doing this, don't we run the risk of messing up the constant rules and ending up with an infinite thing? Yeah, absolutely, right? So there's no guarantee if we start to mutate this thing that it will converge on all constants within a finite number of update rules. For our case, it doesn't, doesn't really matter here. Um, if these are, all the, these are all the constants, all the things that can end up at the end, and if there are non-constants in there, they're just skipped by the turtle. It'll just carry on. So it doesn't really matter for our purposes. I think they built in a maximum number of updates that can be applied to a sentence. So we have add production rule. You can imagine there's another mutation operator which says pick a production rule at random and delete it. There's another mutation operator that picks a production rule at random and adds a new successor state or deletes a successor state or picks a su successor state at random, changes the variables, changes the parameter. It's tinkering with the production rules, which means it's tinkering with how any given starting sentence is translated into a sentence which the turtle then traverses. Okay. So the genotype is the starting sentence, or actually, the, sorry, the sentence that's produced that the turtle traverses. The genotype to phenotype mapping is the production rules, and the phenotype is the robot itself. Okay, as always, lots of build up until we get to the pretty pictures here. Um, I think we talked about all this, that's, that's fine. Actually, no, this is a good example here. So here is, um, here you can see some of the variables which are references to production rules themselves. They're all sort of mixed up here. And then you can see the actual constants in here, where constants are the commands that turtle, the turtle, one of the two turtles recognizes. So when we execute these production rules, we might end up with one long string, which I think they show here, um, which contains almost all constants, except there's one non-constant. And I think they ran it out until it was all constants. Doesn't really matter. Okay. Here are the kinds of things that they got. 
Like the Sims creatures, you can see that there's a lot of regularity uh, in here. They used a simpler physics engine than Sims's physics engine, so they could get away with many more pieces. What kinds of regularity do you see in these robots? There's a lot of rectangular shapes, right? Go forward, turn 90 degrees, go forward, turn 90 degrees. So you definitely see repetition, right? That's obvious. That's one kind of regularity. But repetition is not the only kind of regularity here. The sizes are the, are the same. Yeah, I think that's built in. I don't think it could make bars of different length. All the bars are the same size. I think she means like a B, where it's like it's made, it's kind of like L piece, and they didn't get smaller. Yes. Like Sims sometimes have like tail things. That would get smaller and smaller and smaller. That's that's true. Yeah. Uh, so there are lots of chains, chains of things, like chains of the shapes. Uh, absolutely. So chains, uh, sh chains, chains of shapes, not chains of cylinders. So you get these sort of mid-level structures, right? So squares and other kinds of shapes that are repeated. So we get repetition, but we also get repetition of higher order structure, which means we're in the presence of hierarchy, right? So repetition occurs and repetition of repetitions of things. We're getting this hierarchy. So regular repetition, hierarchy, what other kinds of the top right, yep. the width right, um, created a wave structure, almost like a sea monster. Yes, exactly. So we got Champ up there in the, the top right. Champ is not strictly bilaterally symmetric. So if you cut it down the long axis here, you can see left doesn't match right. Uh, I don't know if there are any bilaterally symmetric creatures in here. It, it is possible. You also see radial symmetry, the one in the top left there. Right As you go around, it's radially symmetric all the way around. Most importantly, you can see self-similarity. Remember that L systems tend to produce fact fractal patterns. So if you stare at this long enough, you'll see certain patterns that are rep reproduced. A pattern is made up of smaller versions of the same pattern, self-similarity. OK. It looks nice. Does it matter? It definitely does matter. Because all of those kinds of regularity tend to be helpful in locomotion. And hopefully this will load for us. All right, there's Champ in the top left and a radially symmetric robot in the bottom right. So as always, we're evolving for locomotion and that regularity seems to be useful. The question is, how useful actually is it The answer is it turns out to be quite useful. So what are we looking at here? In the top left plot, as always, we're looking at increase in fitness over time, how quickly these robots could move over evolutionary time. And the dashed line that you see down here at the bottom is a control case in which they did everything the same, except they, rem they did not bias evolution towards regular structures. How did they do that? In this case, in the control case, instead of evolving production rules, the genotype was the string of body and brain commands itself. So evolution was just evolving strings of random collections of commands. And by doing that, you ended up with things like you see down here, which have no obvious regularity in them. The turtle is executing those commands, but it's a collection of random commands. So the turtle is sort of just doing a bunch of random things which again produces perfectly viable robots, but they lack regularity. And it turns out it is much more difficult for evolution to evolve strings of these random commands than in the top case. Both evolutionary algorithms are traversing exactly the same fitness landscape, which is the space of all possible strings of commands you can send to the turtles. But these two evolutionary algorithms happen to exist in different parts of the fitness landscape. In this part, down here, there's a whole bunch of local hills. It's all rugged. It's very hard for evolution to make progress. 
In the case of the full system, it's, mo it's moving in some other part of the fitness landscape that corresponds to points in the space, which correspond to robots that have regular structure. And if you have regular structure, a mutation that moves you in that part of the space may add or remove a segment to CHAMP, which doesn't really affect CHAMP's ability to do its thing, right? But adding and removing a random component to one of these things probably does disrupt its ability to move. Right? So going all the way back to our discussion about locomotion, regularity, symmetry, repetition, hierarchy, these things are all useful for getting around in the world, which is very important for our robots. Okay, I think we will leave things there for today. You have a quiz due tonight, and I will see you on Tuesday. Thank you.